Tell me Buddy, a little bit about yourself and your journey into behavioural science. Great, and I'm really disappointed. I thought Chris only called me Lord, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> makes it's an so honour he bestows to many people and yes, we absolutely yes, love yes. it and don't want him to stop so... I do, he said it to all the girls um, <laughs> so um, a pleasure to be here everybody and um, and uh, I've always been a massive fan of 42 courses from the beginning and um, I think together we've managed to trade over 20,000 people so it's, it's super exciting because um, uh, I really care about evangelising the fields of applied behavioural science and believe that they often are the missing seat at the table. I don't think we should be the only seat at the table. I think we should always seek to work and have long arms and work with lots of different disciplines. But I do think we're often the, the missing seat at the table. And that's over the past 11 years I've been practicing with Ogilvy has, has really started to change, which is really, really exciting. So I studied psychology back in the day. The, um, the funny part of that story is I originally wanted to study philosophy, but during my A-levels accidentally ticked psychology and about six weeks in realized that um i wasn't in psychology lessons um i wasn't in philosophy lessons rather and um but it was a very very happy accident i and studied at york and um i met some great professors who were great at evangelizing and really simplifying down the complex worlds of, of behavioral science and really and really focusing on the application and then um during my, my final years i um became um really obsessed with Dan Ariely, Rory Sutherland, who I now get to work with, um, and um, really just seeing the potential for for what the behavioural sciences and deep human insight can do for the worlds of the private sector and the public sector, ultimately. And um, really have a deep belief that um, people often think that behavioural science is kind of the opposite of creativity, and in some respects it can be, but in the way that, that I like to practice it with, with Ogilvy is... Um, is really making sure that actually we can use behavior science to stimulate creativity to make people think even broader than they normally would do so i think that's one of the real un untapped superpowers of behavior science that's me that's a really great story dan uh hearing somebody as as you told us you know at the outset you were looking to these people as your mentors uh, and then you know, you're you're working with these people every day so it's it's such a lovely story and um as you say you've been with Ogilvy really for the full length of the time that it's had its behavioral science unit started by Rory and Jez and now, Jez has told me, no longer with Ogilvy, but Jez has told me a very interesting story about the way they himself and Rory started behavioural science in that it wasn't so much as anybody gave them permission to start it. It was more that it was sort of going on in the background with various experiments that they then could tell people, well, you don't think it works, but by the way. Now, the one I'm thinking of, Dan, that Jez has told me is something to do with... Um, in in the restaurant maybe or in the in the canteen with carrots have you heard this story <laughs> yeah it was yeah like maybe you'd like to just it's a very, such a simple story but so effective maybe you'd just like to share that story with everybody absolutely yeah and um and first of all to say yeah, yeah, i have a huge respect for for jazz and, and for rory of course and in really kickstarting the space and, and doing wonders really for, for growing it all. So um, massive uh, thank you to those, to opening it up for all of us really, to um, to practice and make, make a career out of it. So thanks, Jess. Um, and the, um, the, the great um, skill I think there was really um, making sure that um, the, the experiment itself is, is, is interesting, we'll talk about it, but the, the cleverness of it is really making sure that we were speaking the language of the organization. I'm not sure it would have worked in a bank um, as much as it worked at Ogilvy, for example, but I'm sure we would have done something else in a bank. So um, so ultimately, um, Ogilvy is about, in the UK, is about a thousand um, very creatively minded people um, who all like to go for lunch. And so um, we did some, well, they did some experiments um, on our choices and so they did a range of things to drive people to pick more healthier options ultimately um, which was having kind of more carrot options using the, um, the psychology of language to um, uh, add adjectives to the to the carrots I think they called them succulent carrots um, and um, and uh, and some other psychological techniques to drive that and they got some some great results and were able to then play back to the organization 
Um, it's not really a gotcha moment, but uh, did you know um, that, that your carrot consumption as is, is a, is a total of a thousand people say increased as a result of things that you didn't notice, um, which is which is um, which is super fun. And the salad bar is still very popular in Ogilvy, probably. Due to <laughs> now, what I absolutely love about that story is within the world of behavioral science, of course, there's a lot of terminology we talk about bias you know we're using words yeah. that you have to learn about what do they mean and yet that concept is so simple that when people are having conversations with you and saying well how can I bring it into my business you can give that very simple example and suddenly it seems like the veil of the subject falls away and people realize that sometimes yeah. it's the simplest of change maybe just in a word or a movement or a different route or something and I think really that is that that's sort of a core tenet of behavioral science would you agree Dan? I would yeah and um, it's really interesting actually because I think that was exactly the right thing to do then exactly the right thing to do then and um, I since uh, during COVID like everybody else got a bit bored so I started to start a podcast on the um on the growing pains of applied behavioral science. We interviewed about 20 plus different of the different behavioral science leads around the world. It's a great way of kind of um, understanding what was going on and kind of showing that with everybody else. And um, one thing that was kind of coming up as a common theme was um, those silver bullet stories of a simple change with a big impact, kind of an outsized impact, disproportionality effect, um, were really helpful back in the day. And they still play a big role today in really helping to capture people's attention on the first time. But when you think about a behavioral science maturity curve, and obviously different countries and organizations and people within the organizations are all at different points within there. There's also the um, the downside of, of the silver bullet story that it makes it sound too easy and too magical. And, and there's someone doesn't get that, that, that result when they start to do it for the first time. They don't get tr trans formative results straight away that could be a challenge so I think like everything um it's a sweet spot you know everything's on a spectrum and um and there's a sweet spot in that spectrum which is you want to make it sound really captivating and and um and impactful um but you also want to recognize that often you get to that rigor um get to those great in insights through the rigorous process of behavioral science as well so a sweet spot I think mm. And is there a particular project that you've worked on with Ogilvy that really is like close to your heart? You would, would say that was my pet, my pet <laughs> project. There is. I'm laughing because if anybody from the team is watching this, they will probably turn off because I've heard it a million times. But um, a couple of years ago, we worked with Gatwick Airport and I just am um, absolutely in love with aviation and think they're great places to do kind of behavioral science observations. So when I finally got paid to kind of sit at airport security and watch people go through it was um it was an absolute joy so we worked at Gatwick airport and at the time it was to look at reducing what they called the liquid reject rate which essentially means when you go through security we've all had that fuss and bother of having to take our liquids out of our bags so they can be scanned separately oh, and so yes <laughs> not too much because of the liquid bombers that really uh, uh you know really really cause that issue for us um and um and people don't always get it right. So what happens when they get it wrong is they, they're, you know, you've all seen the arm of death where your bag gets shoved onto the conveyor belt and then you're going to be in the queue for it to be to be looked at. And um, that creates queues, that creates dissatisfaction with, with the airport security process that takes away time from people shopping or getting to eat or sometimes missing flights when, when you get queues there. So there's a lot of effort that goes through to make sure we get the sweet spot again, a um, bit of a theme of um, making sure it's a safe process, but also making sure it's actually a system that gets, you know, hundreds of thousands of people through every day. I think about 100,000 people go through Gatwick every day. And um, so the challenge here was, how do we look at this? And they'd worked on this for years from kind of a, what we might, what this group will call a system two perspective. Um, you know, they'd put up signs, you know, they'd, they'd, they'd really, um, they'd listen to the security guards and the security guards would say, basically the French, and the Italians. Um, so they put up signs in French and Italian outside to translate to make sure they got it right. It made no difference. And um, so we wanted to bring a behavioral science lens into how do you get people to take their liquids out of their bags and pack them correctly when they go through security. So we um, had a mixed methods. We 
went at all different times to do observations and surveys with people. Um, and um, so we'd watch what was happening going through the lanes. We'd see kind of, I mean, the most insane things would happen. People would be taking circular saw blades through security and be confused why they were getting pulled over. There would, um, and, and a lot of people just basically forget that they bought a water bottle and it's in the bag. Um, a lot of people don't understand that a, a cream, like a suntan lotion, is actually a liquid. Um, cheese is a bit of a, a mixed one. You don't, there's basically hard cheese isn't a liquid, and then some brie and soft cheeses are a liquid technically. So there's, it's, it's not, it's not as, as simple as, it, as you might think, but there's a lot of work that can be done by just making it kind of easier to be understood. We found, um, we also looked at lots of the data. We looked at long haul, short haul, hand luggage only, not hand, you know, with, with, with suitcases, and that made a difference. Nationality, uh, age. Uh, we looked at all of the data points you could imagine, really, and came to the conclusion that it's quite spread. And actually, it isn't that it's a particular um, group that, that really gets it wrong. It's, it's actually it's quite it's, it's outbound passengers versus returning. You know, I'm quite organized on the way out and I'm an absolute mess on the way back. You know, could, could be all of those different things. And it wasn't. Um, so we basically did that mixed methods approach. We um, then did a behavioral science workshop with a load of the security agents and, and people that worked at the airport and, and our creatives and, um, and generated some ideas. And um, one of the ideas that I found um, most interesting, I can't really talk about the, the case really, really beyond this point too much, um, is, um, is this idea of really trying to recognize. I mean, some people don't know the rules. Some people don't remember the rules and some people don't care about the rules. Most behavior change barriers falls into those three, mm -hmm. three categories. And um, and so we had to design something that, that really just got people to kind of trigger their, their system two brain as they zombie through the, um, through the security gates. And so we had a point of choice, a forced choice moment of whether you would consider yourself security ready or whether you need a few more moments to pack. So security ready, quick line straight straight through, uh, um, need some more help, you would go through to the room with kind of tables where you could repack a bit more in private. Um, secretly, these were called the corridor of education, a reminder, and the corridor of doubt. So basically, if you thought you were ready, we reminded you of things that be over overconfident people forget. And if you need help, we give you all this simple support that you have. And then you kind of you 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 measure from there. But um, it was a really interesting, and I'll stop there on that one. But it was a really interesting um, situation. One of the most interesting findings was that um, one of the reasons we suspect um, they were misdiagnosing the problem is because when we watched French and Italian people being pulled over, they were more likely. There's a higher instance rate of them um, being quite expressive. And, and annoyed about being pulled over. The, the body language of, of the nation just seems to be more, 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 um, uh, seems to be larger. <laughs> uh, we, remember, we, we suppose that the security agents were kind of looking, just remembering more, encoding the memory of those situations more, and then assuming a high incidence rate among, amongst that group. Even though the exact same amount of British people were pulled over, they were just a bit more polite and shy and bashful about it. So they weren't remembered as much. So a really interesting case of making sure that you really diagnose uh, the problem ultimately. And I, I think it's what you say is, is a case close to my heart, not just because of the sector, but I really like it when behavioral science can help us to kind of myth bust. And because um, and I think that's one of the, 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 the first seeds of creativity is to kind of overcome any false assumptions. We can't get to a new space if we're kind of clinging on to the, kind of the the problems of old that we think are there. Fantastic story. Thanks, Dan. And of course, it reminds me of the uh, very well-known uh, behavioral science change that was done in the airports in terms of the distance of the walk to yes. collect your luggage so that just by walking further, your luggage was actually there and then you wouldn't have to wait. Again, an example of such a simple solution. Uh, and as you say, the, the concept really behind behavioral science that we're taught, you know, the EAST framework, the first of which is easy, is really yes. it's really crucial, isn't it? It's really we're simple creatures, yes. humans, uh, and it's got to and extremely lazy, and it's got to be <laughs> uh, extremely easy for us to make this make this change now. 
the next can one I, I'd can love I see a very yes, uh, quick go. other airport case studies because I won't forgive <laughs> it's myself. It's going to be all about that. airports today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Um, um, you'll know Professor Dilip Soman. He's spoken at Nudgesuck before. Um, and um, and I'm pretty sure this is his study. I've certainly seen him present it. But it was an amazing case of of a very unexpected change that that did that, that um, changed the very sticky behavior. So you know when you're queuing up to check in, and sometimes you can have a bit of a queue there. And um, a lot of the reason that queue is there is because people don't have their tickets and kind of their documentation ready when they get to the check-in desk because everybody's kind of everyone's a bit nervous when they're traveling. They want to they're usually wearing a backpack that they don't usually wear, for example. They stuff important stuff really deep in so it doesn't get nicked. And so when you get to the check-in desk, another one minute is spent finding the right documents to to actually check in. And so what the airport's response was um, is to go around and kind of pay people and put up lots of signage and all the languages to say, please have your tickets or your documentation ready for when you check in. It'll uh, speed up the queue. And you'd think that would work because that's what everybody wants right now is to get through the queue. But it doesn't work because everyone's a bit nervous about their passport getting nicked and keeps it in a really safe place that's harder to take out on the right time. What the psychologist managed to do is anticipate that the principle of feeling in system would change that behavior, which basically means, you know, sometimes you get that small piece of carpet by the check-in desk. They extended that carpet by about six feet into the queue. So essentially the first one, two, three, four people were stood on that carpet and it made them feel next. When you feel like you're next, you get your tickets out, you get ready. So just pulling the carpet out into the queue stops, solves the problem by quite a chunk because it makes you feel like you're in system, like you're next, and you naturally do the right behavior. Now, nobody, I don't think, without having behavioral science, is going to, even people that sell carpets, don't know <laughs> that they are sat on a behavior change gold mine, um, ultimately. And so that's what I find amazing about behavioral science, is it shows us so many more possibilities um, of what we can do. The challenge is then finding out which possibility is the right one. Great story. I'm keeping my eye on the time because speaking to everybody who's with us here today, of course, we do want you to put your questions to Dan. So we'll chat for another few minutes and then start putting your questions in the chat box and I'll bring you in uh, to put them to Dan. Um, um, so the other question I wanted to ask you, Dan, is let's you did mention uh, that Dilip Soman had spoken at Nudge Stock. For those of you who joined us uh, today, Nudge Stock, I'm sure you all know, is the annual behavioral science festival hosted uh, by Ogilvy. Uh, the last two or is it three years that you've co hosted, Dan? Last two, two or years, three. last three, two. last three years, you're co-hosted now by by Dan and the super Tara Austin, who for some reason last night when I had a complete mental block on Tara's name, uh, I I was then, I, I was saying Austin Power in my head. I was like, why am I thinking Austin? <laughs> she is also. <laughs> the, the super yeah. Tara Austin. <laughs> um, uh, is there a particular talk from down the years that you, that, you have really liked or that really always sticks in your mind as being something that meant something to you or that you really learned from or even just really enjoyed? Yeah, that's such a good question because we've had so many talks over the years. I mean, it'll be our 12th Nudge Suck this year and during the pandemic, we streamed for 15 hours. So there's been a lot along the way. Um, I mean... The, the cop-out answer is I always re-watch Rory's talks about 20 times. Mm. Um, I've worked with him for 11 years over. And um, and what's amazing is he manages to just speak is so many languages at the same time to people. But if I was to pick one that wasn't wasn't my boss, I would say um, there's a Professor Blay Whitby is an expert in um, the psychology of plane crashes. And he gave a really interesting behavioral science we all know kind of is and isn't new. Um, and what's really interesting is kind of since the 30s, behavioral science, my probably wasn't called that, has been plugged firmly into the aviation um, sector to, to kind of reduce the amount of um, fatalities that we have. 
to make sure that the, the industry prospers and so um and and human beings um but i think he managed to tell some really compelling stories and one of the key things was that um within air crash investigations they don't usually they talk a bit about pilot error but as a concept it's not something they like to it's not something that's going to really help things they often talk about cockpit error so they really put the onus on the context for not being right rather than just kind of the, the fact the human factors on the pilot and i thought that was really really helpful you know those familiar with the combi model you can clearly see the links between kind of the environmental opportunity and and cockpit error and i think it just brings a really nice um perspective on that um humans you know flying at 2 a.m with um a miss a poorly labeled lever are always going to pull the wrong lever um so actually the job is to make a better lever for the pilots not to try and change the human too much and i thought it was a really nice thing that actually i realized that really filters into a lot of the work that we do within ux user experience um and and a lot of work in advertising and that's and kind of it meant a lot to me because it kind of connects a lot of dots back many decades and you realize that um you stand on the shoulders of giants with lots of things and you don't you don't actually invent a lot yourself you just nudge things forward a little mm -hmm. bit super yeah and steve there in the chat just before we leave airports which it seems to have all become very aviation <laughs> themed today but Steve there in the chat saying that at Edinburgh Airport, when you're queuing for the security trays, there was a screen telling people that if you don't unpack correctly, it might take you six minutes longer to get through. So again, a very, a very simple, simple prompt. Now, before I come into the questions, uh, I see that Herbert's raised the 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 awful subject. Do you think the whole topic has been damaged a lot by the whole fraudulent study news with Dan Ariely, et cetera. And I think it would be remiss of me to not sort of talk about that subject. I mean, uh, replication crisis, now that I've looked into it a lot, actually is nothing new. And I thought it was something new, you know, so it's nothing new. And in a way, I do understand that we shouldn't be able in a way to replicate because we're always changing and we're humans. So, you know, in many ways, we can't look at it in that way but what are your uh if you don't mind sharing your your views about not necessarily just that that case but the concept in general so that we don't have to be too pointed <laughs> yes exactly I, I can't let down my fellow dan no, no, um, no the um i mean it's a really interesting subject i if i'm honest i haven't dove into the details too deeply on this one. So I haven't gone down kind of the Twitter rabbit holes and, and looked at all the details and watched all the YouTube videos on it. Um, because I'm pretty certain that behavioral science works. And, um, and I feel like, you know, practiced for 11 years, worked with on thousands of projects with hundreds of brands and done lots of execution and got lots of results. And, and it does work. And at a kind of a theoretical level, it really partners well with creativity to create impact. Um, at a, at a kind of a project level, um, it really, it really seems when you put it side by side with the traditional methods, and we often kind of have traditional method, AI, and then behavioral science with humans, powered by AI and all that kind of stuff. And we, we tend to come out on top most of the time. So, so kind of, I haven't dove into it too much because it felt like a distraction, um, on the, um, and you know, the, the house I'm in is built with thousands of bricks. If two of those bricks aren't right doesn't invalidate the concept of a brick um and uh thank god yes. <laughs> but i but i would i would say that obviously we all have a duty to tell the truth and um and um and it's not good to and I, like i said i don't know and i haven't looked into the case um but it's important that we tell the truth and it's important all the cases that we share are based on the truth not least because that's the right thing by the clients that pay us lots of money in the industry that that gives us all um, a life, to be honest. Um, but actually, people borrow and, and rightfully borrow each other's ideas. So, you know, we do lots of lateral category analysis and we'll look at successes from other categories. And when we, we borrow those techniques and, and, and fix for our own categories. And if we're borrowing things that aren't true, mm -hmm. then then we've got a very big problem, you know. Um, so that's why, I mean, the importance of testing is key to make sure that 
the your principles are working in your environment. Um, but um, but ultimately, I don't really think that behavioral science rests on one study or one or one person. That's a lovely diplomatic answer. Thank you very much, Dan. And, and it is uh, actually what I think. Yeah. And it may or may not be the truth. I'm joking. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, we are maybe biased ourselves to only focus on uh, behavioral science examples that have been successful. Obviously, they're the ones that we hear about. And if you don't mind, if it's not too much of a uh, little bit of a, no. a tender subject... Do you mind at all talking about the reception to uh, the recent Ogilvy uh, campaign done with the mayor of London, uh, the yeah. mate campaign, which had a little bit of a kickback, which was actually equally interesting to see the response to it. And of course, we learn again from response to these yes. experiments so would you like to just tell everybody just very quickly the basis of what I'm talking about and and then how the reception was a little bit mixed Ab absolutely yeah I mean yeah we launched a campaign during a culture war about culture so there was going to be some things the um we were yeah for the past couple of years we've worked um really closely with the mayor yeah. of London on a really important topic on misogyny and knowing that you know many women in london and beyond um have have suffered the the negative effects of that um we thought it was important to to, to try and tackle that and, and to bring behavioral science working hand in hand with our the advertising part of our business to to do what we can on that subject and we're a very small piece of a very big problem but um we're kind of happy to play our play our role there and um the first campaign that we did was um uh called have a word so basically you can see the clips online see, see the clips on um, the films that we we created and it was all about how um it's re really hard to tackle the perpetrator it's much easier and more effective to tackle the people around the perpetrator tackle their mates so really asking men to kind of the friends of perpetrators to step up in the moment and say this isn't right ultimately really really killing that bystander effect and we had some good success with that. And um, and then we realized that after the first year of kind of launching that awareness, um, you know, we got it into the UN curriculum. It was, it was really successful. Um, we then had to give people that word that we told them about. And anyone who's kind of behavioral science fans in the room, which I'm sure everybody is, will know about the designated driver case study, about how you can seed language into into the um, the milieu of, uh, of culture, not by telling people exactly what to say all the time, but actually just by kind of getting that language used. So, you know, the terms designated driver was put, was popularized by a Canadian PR firm, not necessarily straight away by comms, explicit comms, but by kind of writing into TV and soap scripts and, and all that type of thing. I think it was Fraser, I can't remember. Um, so a re really lovely technique. And we were kind of were similarly thinking that that would be a helpful way of doing it. So we had different comedians. We had Ron with Frank and Nathan kind of use the terms that we created um, to kind of really seep it into culture, which was then confirmed by um, by some campaigns that were um, launched later on. Um, we actually didn't have much kickback until it was, <laughs> it was the mayor of London. Um, so so I do think the messenger of the campaign, um, but rather than the campaign, it can really change things. And um, politics is not an easy space. Um, I was presenting this at the Babel Insights team a couple of about a month ago now, and um, full agreement that po politics is not an easy space to play in. Uh, it just certainly doesn't come without kickback. Now, the word that we came up with was um, mate, um, because that is the word after doing many observations. We've been kind of undercover in gyms and barber shops across London, kind of finding out what language people actually use, you know, in quite male dominated environments. And, um, and the word mate. Um, was the word that we we found after um, testing it and researching it was was going to be the most powerful to kind of really saying, um, getting that sweet spot again sweet spots between kind of um, not ostracizing the, the the man from the group, um, but but educating the guy and keeping him in the friendship group for kind of that long term benefit. Um, it can be tempting to want to just chop and cut, um, but but the, the the smartest thing we think is to really kind of is to help the people grow um, so we can have a better society. 
So um, we launched ha um, Mate uh, with an elongated A because it kind of um, uh, ha had the effect that we had wanted to have. And um, and the reception was, was we had some amazing reception and we had some bit of kickback as well. So um, we had kind of Caitlin Moran saying this is, you know, one of the, the, the um, one of the most powerful campaigns she's seen in the, in, in the area. We had the spectator um, taking the word mate, but uh, having a go at the mayor of London about other um, <laughs> other issues. Um, but in general, there, there was a, there was a mixed debate about it because everyone has it's a very emotionally charged area, and and some people have diff would rather see different techniques. Um, but ultimately, we're, we're quite certain that we went through a big process of due diligence this wasn't kind of just we didn't think of mate overnight and, and get it out there this was a, a based on a lot of psychology and a lot of testing with a lot of customers and um and the proof is in the pudding right i think that the proof is in um not necessarily in commentators but the proof is in the the kind of the research and evaluation criteria we have now set up for the next couple of years um so so I, I think we'll, uh, we'll we'll figure that one out in 2027. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks so much for sharing that, Dan. As I say, I think it's equally important, isn't it, to talk about things that do have these mixed reactions and not just be like the 100% gold cases. Yeah. And is that particular case in the 2023 annual? I think it is. So just to tell everybody, uh, if you go to the Ogilvy website, there's a free download of the behavioral science annual i've actually got the 2022 one here which i think you can still access online as well and it has case studies that ogilvy have worked on it's really interesting you can download that for free so i do advise you go away and do that and then that case was uh dis that behavioral science project was discussed during nudge stock this year which again you can access online on the ogilvy youtube is that right yeah yeah yeah. So um, I do want to, as I said, bring everybody in, um, you know, that you can find more about Dan's work from uh, in our applied behavioral science course that he is uh, strongly present in. And of course, I only learned this this morning, Dan, I didn't realize you wrote basically the 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 framework of the original behavioral economics course our very first course so you're very present through all of our work um so if uh samantha has the bandwidth to turn on her video and join us i know you're still with us samantha i'll ask you to unmute if you don't mind would you like to ask your question samantha? fine um great about the about the framework oh, which you. is really interesting yeah, um, I guess, I mean, East is used a lot um, and it makes it easy for people to use and think about behavioral <laughs> science. So it's using it in and of itself, isn't it? And, it, you know, it's great from that point of view. And I think it's a really good starting point. But I guess the question is, um, maybe it's just me, but I find it a bit too reductive and a bit vague because obviously it's naturally collapsing a lot of different principles and biases, isn't it? So yeah. actually, yeah, it's good to get the concept at a very high level but I find that it can be a bit limited um and so but yet it seems to endure so much and everyone still is banging on about east and I just think can't we be a bit more sophisticated without <laughs> having to be you know academics about it um lovely. so I guess I find like mind space is a nice balance but any thoughts lovely thanks very much Samantha and you might very quickly touch on how you use ocean at work as well Dan whilst we're on this subject yeah absolutely so I mean it's such a good question and um from a kind of a behavioral science movement perspective I'm really happy that there's kind of models of different levels in this kind of east mind space I mean there's, there's tons aren't there and and we're getting more and more that are being published that are quite specific to different industries too which I think is ultimately where 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 the most help can be and um and so you mentioned east which is yeah four components mind space that which is nine components and i i still find mind space can be quite a helpful memory jog um it doesn't if we're dealing with a very big sticky challenge we, we tend to go a lot deeper but sometimes you know if you're doing something quite quickly mind space can be can be really helpful um and, and 
helpful to co-create with others because you can kind of teach it quite quickly and people get people get it um and um what we tend to do at Ogilvy Consulting is to um would be a lot more rigorous than that on on the projects that we have so we would um would have lots of different data feeds that come in um that would help us to select the right behavioral science principles and then 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 we'd kind of use those to 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 ideate for the solutions so for example we do a lot of work with cognitive profiling which is essentially looking at people's personality profiles like ocean like louise is saying um their cultural worldviews and then also their cognitive thinking styles so kind of three buckets of of ways that we can differ in in kind of fields of psychometrics um so rather than just looking at demographics and rather than just looking at um different behaviors that people do we're looking at how they really think because we can then infer for different segments of, of of mindsets um how they would best respond so for example on the personality um profiling that louise talks about um if we take extroversion and introversion because that's one that we all get um some of us are extroverts some of us are introverts some of us are a bit of both some of us kind of change a bit depending on the context um, but we tend to kind of have one where we where, where we kind of rest if you're an extrovert so if a segment over indexes on extroversion against other segments we'd be more likely to use a principle known as uh, social proof which i'm sure you know um because extroverts just like to do what other people are doing. There's that social comparison thing that's really important. If we have a, a segment that over-indexes on loss of um, on introversion, we'd be more likely to use the principle or test the principle with them of loss aversion, of pointing out what you stand to lose rather than what you stand to gain. So there's a matchmaking exercise to be done between the the, the cognitive profile that you have and the and the behavioral levers that we would pull. Now they're not as simple and as fixed as that they can they uh often would do the research um to find out what what one matches the best but once you have that um it's much easier to know that you're dealing with kind of the the behavioral science palette of principles that are going to be most effective than that rather as you were saying samantha on on, on east where it's kind of the, the same for each time brilliant thanks so much uh for talking that through dan and i know that the more um sort of advanced market research agencies are very much adapting now to that profiling technique rather than using standard demographics as they would have done in the past that's really interesting um now i'd also like to bring in corin if you have the bandwidth corin to uh join us and put your question to dan uh, you were talking about uh, people able to unpick their behaviour. Would you like to put your question to Dan, Corin? Yeah. Can you hear me okay? We can, Corin. Go and, ahead. And it's lovely, lovely to, to see you. Amazing. Hello, Dan. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> nice to see the uh, <laughs> Um, I just always wondered this, whether there's people out there who are so tuned in to themselves that they can actually pick apart their behaviour what really is motivating it whereas we kind of you know the david ogilby saying like you know people don't say what they think it can anyone short circuit that and actually know and like could we use those people could they help us to try and like <laughs> understand new biases and yeah. heuristics Love that. that's a lovely question thanks corin very a, a very core human basic question so i don't know if you'll actually have the answer to that dan but do go ahead no it's wonderful and my perspective on it would be that um we can all do it some of the time at any point you can switch into your kind of i know it's a it's a metaphor it's an abstract concept isn't it of system on system two but if we want to introspect on a particular moment of what happened during a day you know a coach or a friend or a mentor can help us zoom into that situation and kind of deconstruct it. And we can look at all the factors and we can, you know, a therapist might help you understand um, the different factors involved. It might be against a model. It might not be. Maybe it's just mine. Um, and um, and you can really start to deconstruct a moment. What we can't do is do it every day, all of the time. So I think, I think it's, I think people vary on their kind of ability to introspect definitely and then 
every moment of the day is not equally introspected upon. Um, so I guess if that person did exist who could kind of introspect all the time, they'd be dedicating a lot more of their processing power to the act of introspection and, and, and not doing other things. Um, so I don't think they'd be very interesting. Uh, or they'd be very interesting because they know a lot about a lot of stuff. Um, but yeah, no, I, th I think uh, I think introspection and and being aware of the biases at play is is a muscle. And um, the wonderful thing about behavioral science is it's a it's a lattice work framework of which you can hang your ideas upon. You know, you can you can use the language and the terminology of behavioral science to think through things and to understand the different concepts at play. It kind of having words for the intangible helps us talk about the intangible, and that's often where a, a lot a lot of progress can be. So yeah, I I think the answer, Karen. And I'd, and, I'd, and I'd love further perspectives, but I think it's kind of, we kind of all can introspect, but it's kind of, we have to turn it on and off and we just can't afford to turn it on all the time. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks, Corinne. Uh, so now I'm going to ask uh, Trevor if he doesn't, uh, if he's able to join us to uh, unmute yourself, Trevor, you had a lovely question on brand purpose, something we all like to chew on which hopefully will turn the corner away from but would you like to put your question yeah. Trevor to Dan you're very yes welcome, thanks Louise and hi Dan it's been in the press this morning that Unilever are rowing back from brand purpose so it's not suitable for all their brands and the marketeer Mark Ritson has been on this for some time we we know you know the the off-quoted consumers don't think how they feel why do we still use market research that tells us people are going to go for the latest sustainable thing, the latest vegan thing, when we know it's not true? <laughs> That's a very, very good question. And I think um, there's probably a couple of things swimming around in my head. Um, the the cynical answer is because there's, there's million, billion dollar market research firms that exist uh, and want to keep existing. The, the less cynical part of... of um, the um of, of myself would say that um sometimes it can be interesting to understand why people think what they think what why they think that um so what they say is interesting but why they why they say is more interesting so even if it isn't quite quite right it's still kind of helpful to know where their heads are at so we can do that kind of from to exercise but absolutely i think that's why behavioral science as as a as a movement is taking making so much progress is because we're understanding that that kind of mixed methods you know a adding adding complementary methods to the to that process is really helpful i think one of the challenges that with behavior science is we don't yet have all the answers and so we're not able to kind of stop the the the, the, in the incumbent if, if, if we want to frame it like that because because we have all these different mixed methods and they and they they make progress and but and they add to the picture. But I guess, I guess it for me it kind of goes back to that piece at the beginning of behavioral science is often the missing seat at the table, but isn't necessarily should be the only seat at the table. It's a great question. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm going to bring in Andrea Redfern if you are uh, able to unmute yourself, Andrea. A very general question. I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Would you like to put your question, Andrea, to Dan about his challenges? Unmute and come on video somehow, if it works. Uh, <laughs> morning, everyone, and good afternoon, good evening in other markets as well. Uh, yeah, a bit more general, but still really intriguing to, to hear. What do you think is your biggest challenge in your role and also how you tackle it? Thanks, Andrea. <laughs> Not on hours of the day. <laughs> <laughs> um, as in that it would be the challenge and and um the ability to answer the question no i think um i think the biggest challenge is that um behavioral science um the maturity people are at such different places on the maturity curve and so we have to be able to shape shift um quite quickly during the day to having quite sophisticated conversations with 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 people that are quite quite deep in you know, already will be doing cognitive profiling and already will be doing quite sophisticated behavioral science pieces and figuring out how we, how we stretch there. And then, but then also still having that mode of being able to introduce new new minds and the, the curious into behavioral science and making sure that we position our um, products and services in ways that can kind of 
help people up that maturity curve ultimately. So it's kind of been able to speak lots of languages and and, uh, and the exciting part of the role definitely is um, been able to figure out how to work with so many different organizations and, and what would work for so many different departments. You know, um, we, we remain quite a broad practice in terms of um, all the different parts of the business that we could, that we touch. We don't particularly tend to specialize in just digital transformation or any anything like that. It's, it's quite broad. And so that's certainly, that's the, the exciting part, but also there's a lot of shape shifting every day and learning lots of people's languages. Whether I think some people have the luxury of kind of going into just one industry and learning all the jargon and, and living off that. But I feel like I'm constantly Googling things while I'm on phone calls to understand what's been said sometimes. But um, yeah, <laughs> lots, lots of deep, deep jargon. Um, but um, definitely worth it. That's how we break new ground. That's lovely, Dan. And of course, we're all very much in favour of uh, constantly learning. So that's obviously <laughs> what you're doing. Now, I did want that to be the last question. We're getting close to time now, but I've just seen that Steve has put a very good question there in the chat. If you're able to join us, Steve, to put that question to Dan, if not, I'll read it. Are you still with us, Steve? I'll start the question he might take over. Steve has just asked there, any advice or thoughts? He's a creative director with an interest in behavioral economics. No others in the, this is a question I often hear, no others in the agency that had knowledge. Uh, how is it, you know, that you can introduce this subject in your company without people thinking you're the, the nut, nut job at the top of the table? <laughs> uh, I mean, as we, when we opened this event today, you know, we were talking about, experiments going on in the background to then present and say look you didn't even know this was going on so I mean that is one approach but what would be your comment on that in introducing it into your agency your company etc mm, that's a really good question and I feel like um the more I learn about introducing behavior science to organizations the, the 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 fewer answers I have on kind of simple fixes do you know what I mean like it's um it's a it's a complex there's 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 a big di it's, it ultimately takes diagnosis to figure out what is kind of the missing piece of the um of the puzzle you know is it that they fundamentally don't believe the kind of the creative aspects of it or that they have had a mental model that's based on quite an engineering led way of thinking rather than a psychological way of thinking is it that they don't think their their superiors and the organization are going to buy into it is it that um is it that everyone's actually just really busy and don't have time to experiment and try new things? Is it that you've um, tried to bring in three new things before that have absolutely failed and they don't believe that this one's going to be any different? There's so many different um, reasons why it wouldn't work. There's also lots of reasons why it would work. And so often, if I was to leave you with anything, it would be that um, painting that future state is often really helpful and um because people aren't often very good at visualizing the things that you've visioned in your head so kind of concretely painting that that future space is really helpful and the other way is uh, <laughs> as as you said that um jez and rory so cleverly did in the early days louise you just kind of just do it <laughs> you just do it find a way to just do it and then and then once it's done um uh, be kind of is it entrepreneurial act like a pirate all that all that all that stuff um i think kind of just just do it secretly and then tell people afterwards i, I think that's a super answer to the question dan because uh, as you say it's a, a question that often comes up but actually maybe what you should do is step back and start to ask your unique questions for your situation and why it is you think that there's resistance i think that's a very mm. good answer well just before we wrap up and i want to thank all of you for joining us today it's been fantastic to see so many joining us and to have your great questions see all the chat going on at the side and uh i'm going to ask chris to unmute himself and i'm going to add him into our chat here hi there chris i'm sure you have a, a lovely wrap-up question for dan and would like to also <laughs> thank him for joining us at this event. i don't know whether i have a wrap-up question i <laughs> I, I, I want to chat with Dan for about five days and never run out of questions. But yeah, thanks so much for joining. Um, yeah, I mean, we, 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 yeah, you're a, you're a huge part of, of of our founding story of the company. So um, yeah, thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, do do you ever have like a, a sort of a favorite go to behavioral science experiment or a favorite bias? And and then I saw someone else ask something in here which I was also kind of intrigued about is 
when you're trying to look for interesting things like where do you go to find those with your curiosity like um is there are there a few particular websites or podcasts or something that you listen to that you're always like oh yeah must uh must listen to that because then i'll get my next breakthrough <laughs> can i be really honest <laughs> i think for the first eight or nine years of my career i listened to everything everything <laughs> and then lately I find that I just want to listen to kind of comedy in the evenings and things. So I don't know if I, I um, and it's not falling out of love with behavioral science. It's, it's. I think it's kind of. I'm so lucky to work in a large network with a large team, but people send things to me all the time. Always saying and knowing you, Chris and Louise, and, and people send very interesting, um, very interesting research. Just the other day, some uh, Rory sent through actually, um, a great piece of research, and I, I won't quote this exactly right, but um your glucose levels react to when you see you're about to eat a sugary food. So if, if the packaging says it's high in sugar, your body gets ready for it as like an anticipatory response. So it can be as bad to see that it's bad for you as it is actually bad for you. Um, so like if it says high in sugar, and um, but it, it's actually not, then your body still reacts as if it's high in sugar because that's what it's seen. So I'm, I'm so lucky to be, to be around people that just chill out some interesting things. Hopefully, I'll get back to to reading again soon. But um, I find um the the job that I'm doing is quite um, excuse me, quite high pace, and so actually my my reading time is to is to relax me rather than to interest me. But it's so funny that you say comedians. I think Sorcha, if I yeah. pronounced the name right, has said the same thing. She said lots of comedians are very tapped into human behaviour. I think it's fascinating. They they often have these insane insights about human behaviour, which we yes. end up laughing at so it's, it's probably secretly a, a wonderful thing to look at to be inspired for behavioral science insights i really want to bring comedians in to the agency so to just give us their take because yeah as you say undercover we we did when i was at ogilvy um before i left i got comedians in to come and talk about observation it's brilliant definitely do it i'll uh i can help <laughs> give the secrets yeah <laughs> Lovely. Well, that, that, that's a lovely place, I think, to call a, a close to this. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Dan. It's been fantastic talking to you. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And do go on to the 42 Shameless Plug here, but do go on to the 42 Courses website to explore the courses. But secondly, more importantly, sign up for the newsletter because then you'll hear about upcoming talks like this with Dan that we have. You'll hear about podcasts that Chris has just recorded and we will share with you all of these uh, curious things that have entertained us, links to interesting articles. So we'd love if you'd all join us there by the newsletter do join us again for one of these talks and thank you very much everyone for joining us today in our 42 courses speaker series thank you very much dan thanks, thanks so much everybody. Everybody. thank you, thank yeah, you. Have a fantastic weekend <laughs>